Buenos días. Me es muy grato presentar a la doctora Annie Andrews. Ella obtuvo su doctorado en biología celular en la Universidad de Grenoble en Alpes, Francia. Es investigadora del Comisariado de Energía Atómica y de Energías Alternativas en la ciudad de Grenoble y ha sido investigadora de la Universidad de California en San Francisco. Su trabajo se ha relacionado con las proteínas integrinas, las cuales participan en las uniones célula-matriz extracelular y célula-célula. En particular, una de las contribuciones que más, más me llamó la atención y que la seguí muy de cerca fue el haber propuesto que los microtúbulos y las proteínas de unión a los microtúbulos, las MAP6, son determinantes en la plasticidad neuronal y en las funciones cognitivas. Demostró la función crucial para las MAP6 en la estabilización de la actina sináptica y en la conectividad neuronal. Estableció además un modelo animal deficiente en esa proteína MAP6, que después le llamaron STOP, para el estudio de trastornos mentales, principalmente en la esquizofrenia. Además, demostró que fármacos relacionados con los microtúbulos son procognitivos y posiblemente útiles para tratar trastornos cognitivos que se observan en la etapa temprana de algunos trastornos mentales o neurodegenerativos. Por esto es para mí un honor y un gran gusto presentarles a la doctora Annie Andrux. Muchas gracias. Hi everybody. First, I would like to thank you for the invitation. Of course, I would have preferred to be in Mexico with you, but um, the time are out there and uh, they will be like this. So I'm very happy to speak about uh, our favorite protein, uh, MAP6, which is also known uh, as a stop for stable only polypeptide. At the time, uh, the protein was discovered by Didi Job and Bob Marcolis in the 80s. So I'm glad to um, give you this seminar and to um, uh, show you how we uh, went from uh, microtubule stabilization to uh, cognitive ability. Uh, most of our work is done uh, in uh, mice. So um, it's very clear now that microtubules and actin, cytoskeleton, uh, as well as their effector are very important for cognitive abilities. So cognition is the skill you need to carry out any task from the simplest to the most complex. It's very important for learning, for the memory, to solve problems and to um, make decisions. Also, it's um, uh, well known that uh, cognitive defects are landmark of uh, early phase of neurodegenerative disease, all the disorder, and of course, of psychiatric illness. And uh, cognition uh, ability are supported by several ways in the brain. So first, you have the neuronal connectivity, which means that um, some neurons which are located at one area in the brain are connected to other parts of the brain through axonal extension and axonal tract. Also, at more cellular level, neurons are communicating together through uh, synapses and synaptic plasticity. The ability to modulate uh, synaptic strands is very important. So here, yeah, for example, you have the hippocampus with the dentate uh, gy gyrus um, linked to the CS3 and CR1 um, area of the hippocampus. At the neuronal level, Uh, synapses are very important, and here uh, both the pre- and the post-synaptic compartment. And uh, at the post-synaptic compartment, the dendritic spines is very uh, important for plasticity. And um, we have a modulation of the neurotransmission at this site, uh, as well as uh, morpholo um, morphological um, um, modulation. So. Um, In the team, we are working um, mostly 
on microtubules, but also now in actin. So here are microtubules. So as you most probably know, it's the result of um, tubulin polymerization uh, with um, addition of tubulin dimer at one extremity, which is called the plus N for the growing extremity, and the polymerization of um, tubulin dimer at the other part, the minus N. And this intrinsic dynamic of microtubules is very important in cells to adapt uh, to morpho morphological changes, for example, or plasticity. But this um, intrinsic um, dynamic is tightly regulated by a large number of microtubules effectors. So within these effectors, you have, for example, the plus and binding protein, which um, bind preferentially to the plus and with the EB or clip family. You also have motors able to uh, run along microtubule track, uh, like the kinesins, dynein. Um, to carry some cargo at a specific area. And you have also what we call the structural maps able to bind microtubules all along the lattice. So in them, you have like map 1B, map 2, tau, and map 6 and double cortin, for example. So in my team, we are working on uh, several topics. So the first one is tubulin isotype. So we are very interested to understand um, the, gene, the, number, the large number of genes of tubulin, eight and seven alpha and beta genes. Why are they and uh, why, why we have this diversity? Also in point mutation affecting tubulin and causing a severe neurodevelopmental disorder. So we try to investigate uh, this mutation using EAST system, for example. Also, we have a large part of the team working on tubulin post-translational modification, and especially the tyrosination of the last residue of alpha tubulin, which is key for uh, neurodevelopment, but also for cognition. But today, I would like to spend time on MAP6 stop protein, which, uh, as you will see, are also key for cognitive abilities. So MAP6 protein has been discovered as a stabilizer of microtubules and more especially by Lidejov and Bob Margolis as responsible for the cold stability of neuron. So here you have a neuron. If you expose a neuron to cold temperature, as you can see with the labeling of tubulin, you can still see microtubules in the neuron. If now you are working with uh, in vitro um, tubulins, with purified tubulin, and you incubate uh, tubulin with energy at 30 degrees, and you have a polymerization of microtubules. So here you reach a plateau where you have um, uh, equilibrium between microtubules and the tubulin dimer. And this will stay forever as soon as you give energy to the system. But if you put the solution at uh, zero degree, you have a complete depolymerization of microtubules. So microtubules from pure microtubules are called labi. As opposed, if you purify the MAP6 from grain sample and you add it to the mix, you, know, you have a complete stabilization of microtubules. So it was known in vitro that um, MAP6 stop protein had the ability to uh, stabilize microtubules to the cold. So when I uh, joined a DD job lab, uh, I um, obtained uh, MAPSIS knockout uh, mice, and then we were able to start to work um, with a cell deficient for MAPSIS. So when we uh, obtain this, so either neurons or astrocytes, so again, if you take wild type neurons and you expose them to the cold, as you can see here, you still have microtubule in green, whereas in MAPSIS knockout condition, same thing for astrocytes. And actually, it was the final demonstration that MAP6 stop protein were the protein responsible for cold stabilization. So now if we go to um, um, MAP6 uh, gene organization, so we have only one gene, which is specific to vertebrates. There's no MAP6 protein before vertebrate. One gene several isoforms. 
So here are the main isoforms. So that we are mostly working with the neuronal ones, which are MAPSIS N for neuronal MAPSIS, and MAPSIS E for early. So early uh, MAPSIS E appears at E14 in mouse embryo, and um, after birth, MAPSIS N is the main isoform. So Christoph Bosque did all the cloning of these uh, proteins, uh, genes, uh, and identifies the uh, isoform. So all of them contain two types of microtubule binding domain, the MN module, three, in the um, um, neuronal isoform, and um, other microtubule binding domain known as uh, MC, able to stabilize both uh, for the cold and for uh, the nocodazole. So, uh, more recently in the team, Christian Delphin tried to uh, identify within MAP6 protein which, which was the part responsible for the cold stabilization. So, what did Christian is to be able to produce in vitro recombinant protein um, of MAP6 using baculosystem, system, baculovirus system. So, Christian um, was able to produce MAP6N, E, uh, another isoform, which is found in fibroblast and also part of it. And to make the story short, what Christian found is that the MC module, the central, uh, central repeat of the protein, were able to bind to microtubule only when the mixture was exposed to uh, 4 degrees. So, here you have a binding of the MC module to microtubule. Whereas, if you do the same experiment at 37, you have no binding at all. So it means that it's really an intrinsic property of MAP6 of this MC module to change conformation with the temperature. And the proof is it's here. When we use circular decoism, we are able to show that, yes, indeed, the MC module were changing conformation with the modulation of temperature. So, MAP6 behaves as a cold sensor, able to stabilize microtubules against the cold through the MC domain. So, Christian and Christophe are also able to show that you need two MC modules to be able to stabilize microtubules against the cold. So, we can ask what does cold stabilization is good for? So, um, what we were able to do is to do a nice correlation between the number of MC module, 1 to um, even 30, in various species. So, for example, in human or in, um, I would say, higher primate, you have, we have only one repeat, whereas other primates like Galago or Lemur, Lemurian have three to five repeats. And we were able to make a nice correlation between the number of MC modules and the ability to the species of doing hibernation or torpor. And uh, accordingly, mice, rats, squirrel, or bear, and other um, animals which, uh, who are doing um, hibernation have a large number of MC modules. And interestingly, one specific rat, which is called the mole rat, um, exhibit only one repeat, and the main cause of lethality of this animal is the cold. During the winter, um, most of the mole rats are dying because of the cold. So uh, it really seems that there's a correlation between the number of MC modules and the ability of uh, the species to do hibernation and torpor. And we have started to do pilot experiment in MAP6 knockout mice to try to see why it's necessary to have uh, uh, microtubules uh, um, protection during cold exposure. So we did expose MAP6 knockout mice to cold temperature, and then we investigated the brain, the optic nerve, and what we found is that in wild type condition, you have uh, around 30 to 40 percent of microtubule uh, which remain intact after the cold exposure, and nothing in the knockout uh, mice brain. And uh, in the remaining microtubule, we found very often mitochondria 
um, linked to them. So we believe that perhaps a microtubule protection and the uh, persistence of microtubule is very important to maintain mitochondria close to some synapses during hibernation for the recovery um, uh, after hibernation. So we don't uh, recite more this uh, topic and we still uh, don't know exactly um, for what cold microtubule, uh, cold resistant microtubule are good for. So as I said, uh, microtubule stability is very well known for very long in neurons. And um, it was thought that the structural maps, MAP2, TAU, MAP1B, and MAP6 were crucial for that. But one after one, all the maps, the maps efficient animal models say no. In all this model, we don't have any uh, microtubule breakdown and no major changes in uh, the turnover of uh, microtubules. So it means that the uh, very high stability of microtubule in neurons is not uh, driven by maps, even if we can think about redundancy, but we have um, uh, evidence now in my team that uh, most probably the stability is coming from other ways uh, than uh, from uh, maps. Anyway, what's the knockout of all these maps in mice uh, has told us is that maps have other roles and actually most of the maps a deficient uh, animal model uh, develop synaptic defects and have cognitive um, defect. And I believe that these maps are very important for cognitive ability. And I would like to use MAP6 knockout mice to try to show how and why exactly these maps are important for cognition. So MAP6 knockout mice is viable and um, exhibit very severe behavior, behavioral disorder and a lot of also biological disorder that I'm going to go through. So first, um, as I said, um, the severe cognitive defect exhibited by MAP6 knockout mice are um, associated with a strong synaptic defect. So here the hippocampus, so when we uh, perform some um, study of um, neuronal uh, plasticity, uh, we found, for example, that we have no LTD and no LTP. So here is the LTP, normal mice when you induce um, by uh, electrophysical stimulation uh, a tetanus, you have a condensation of uh, the response here and you have a nice uh, LTP. In no card condition, you have no LTP at all. So LTP is uh, driven both by presynaptic and postsynaptic events. So in presynaptic um, compartment, you have the um, synaptic vesicle, you can, can see it here. So in the MAPSIS knockout no, mice, we have less uh, density of vesicle. And also on the postsynaptic part, it's very well known that plasticity, uh, LTP induce uh, enlargement of the spine and uh, several other things. So we start to, we say I did, to investigate this uh, non-toxic spine in MAPSIS knockout condition. So this work has been done by uh, Mariano Bisbal and Leticia Peris, both Argentinian, and uh, working in my team. Uh, so what we did was a look at non-toxic spines, either in the cortex or in the hippocampus, in culture or in vivo. So in vivo, we have uh, reduced um, non spine density, as you can see here and it's affecting a lot of the mushroom and the stubby, the functional aspect. So we did very simple experiment by doing rescue experiments. So we first rescue um, the knockout, so we took knockout neuron and then we transect back the full length MAP6 E or N and we get a nice recovery. And then we start to use piece of MAP6 to, to see um, to identify what was um, responsible for um, acting um, down to explain plasticity. So again, to make the story short, we discovered that the MC module, the same, uh, which were very important for cold stabilization, were able alone to restore normal density of spine. So as I told you just before, MC modules are not able to bind microtubules, so it's not through microtubules that they are act, 
heating at 37 degrees on spans. So um, what they did, they transferred MC module in uh, heterology, heter in uh, uh, neurons or in uh, recording cell line. And as you can see, in both cases, we have a very nice co-localization of actin with the MC modules, either in neurons or in cell line. And we did some great experiment to show that it's, yes, actually a direct reaction. So MC module, uh, modules are able to bind to actin. And we decided to look what was the consequence of this binding on actin in spines. So for that, we collaborate with Alain Buisson in uh, my institute in Grenoble uh, and work with uh, neuron in culture. So here you have a neuron and um, this neuron can be either at resting state or you can induce um, LTP with a chemical activation. So here, for example, you have a well-type neuron before LTP, then you apply the LTP. So we have span enlargement that we can measure and you have actin burst of polymerization. So it's quantified here in well type condition after induction of LTP, you have, yes, indeed, um, two times increase in volume. And this is not occurring in knockout condition. And you also have a 1.2 uh, factor of extension of actin in spine, not in knockout. So we decided to look at actin dynamic in the spine in well type condition as compared to knockout and also at resting state and after activation. So it's here, so you have a spine, you isolate the spine and then uh, the neuron has been transected with the actin GFP, so then you choose um, the spine and then you uh, frap, so you bleach the fluorescence and then you wait for recovery. So we can do that at resting state. In wild type condition here in black, we have a nice recovery that you can monitor here. So we do that on a large number of spines, of course. Here the knockout condition, we have the nice and similar recovery curve. And then you do the same experiment just after induction of LTP. So in wild type condition, what you can see, you have recovery, which is not complete. About 30% of the actin is now stable and you have no recovery. So you can, mod um, you can um, monitor the mobile fraction, which is able to, uh, to recover. And uh, you have here a nice uh, diminution of um, the mobile fraction in the, um, in the, in the knockout condition. So, um, it means that actin is stabilized in spine after LTP, and when MAPSIT is not present, you have no stabilization of um, uh, actin. You have no stabilization of actin after um, induction of LTP. So, of course, we did um, we did the um, rescue experiment again, and again, the MC module were able to restore a normal actin stabilization spine. So it means that MC module bind to actin and are necessary to induce actin stabilization in, style, in spines following LTP induction. So we went in vitro in collaboration with uh, Laurent Blanchon team in Grenoble, specialist of actin, and we were able to show that yes, indeed, MC module, when incubated with uh, actin, are able to uh, bind in a saturable uh, fashion. We found a KD around 700 nanomolar, and also using turf experiments, so here you have actin filament. If you add MC module, you can start to see bundles, so MC modules, are able to bundle actin. We also perform experiment using electrode microscopy. So here you can see actin filament. And when you incubate them with MAP6 MC module, you can see bundling as we have seen in turf. And if you look more closely, you can see I hope the, uh, some uh, striation of actin bundle here. And actually, the situation is uh, at a pitch of around 35 nanometers. Also, regarding stabilization, we perform 
Perrin experiment, so you did polymerize actin in a um, um, assay tube here, and then you follow um, the disassembly, which is normal with time uh, here. And if you add an uh, MC module in green, you have a stabilization of actin in vitro. So our in vitro experiment were in tight um, correlation with uh, the in vivo experiment. When MC module bind actin, they uh, bundle actin and stabilize actin against the polymerization. So it seems that MAP6 is really key for uh, actin regulation in spine and actually induce some specific actin organization that we don't really know with straightening of the actin filament and bundling of them. So this very specific uh, MAP6 induced organization of actin is most probably important for synaptic plasticity and we can hypothesize that uh, this specific organization can, for example, be key for the no uh, receptor trafficking, like the AMPA trafficking, which is known to occur during um, LTP. So, uh, to summarize this first part, I think that I showed you that MAP6 can contribute to cognitive function, meaning synaptic plasticity and adaptation of uh, bands through the regulation of actin um, uh, thanks to the MC module. So actually, this ab ability of MAP6 to regulate crucially actin uh, can be, I think, shared by other MAPs. And actually, with uh, Isabel Arnal in our institute, we are working with um, Tau. And Isabel was able to show that the Tau was able to interact both with actin and with microtubulin to co-organize the two um, cytoskeleton. And this uh, post talk between uh, actin and microtubule in spines with photo is still under investigation in our teams. So I would like now to shift to a more um, um, integrative study. As I said, um, we um, decided to work on neuronal connectivity and other world to analyze brain anatomy of MAP6 nucleus. Knockout mice. So this work has been driven in his uh, totality by Jean-Christophe Delune, uh, a researcher in my team. So Jean-Christophe made collaboration with the imaging team uh, in our institute in uh, the gene at Grenoble and mainly with Emmanuel Barbier and Anna Larich team. So Jean-Christophe investigates the brain anatomy of the mice so he did a lot of histology, but here I'm showing you what we obtained with brain imaging using NMR and DTI for diffusion tensor imaging. So here you have a gallery of wild type uh, brain and here of knockout brain. So we did a lot of um, um, gallery for several mice and then we are able to do statistic and we found that the MAP6 knockout brain are 15% smaller than the wild type, which is good with the DTI. If you have access to either the white matter in white here or the black matter, uh, thanks to the um, fraction, the anisotropy fraction. So, what we found by doing this, it's actually the brain reduction is mainly due to a reduction of white matter. So we can go one step further using DTI and do fiber tracking. So thanks to the three direction orientation of fiber, you can monitor the size of all the axonal tract in the brain. So it's a long um, a work. But at the end, you have the exact measurement of all the tract. So what we found from MAP6, as for example here, you have the um, um, corpus skeleton and the uh, mammillary tract and the uh, postcomsoral fornix and so on. What we found, some tracts are perfectly normal and others are very abnormal. So this first result is not in favor of the general role of MAP6 in axonal growth, like uh, through microtubule stabilization. As we have normal tracts and abnormal ones, we think that it's not probably that. 
So as I said, some are normal and some other are not normal. And I will focus now on one particular trap, which is the fornix here, which is missing. So you can see it better here, either by DPI or through um, anatomical, um, uh, histological classical analysis. So you can see the trap here. So the mammary tract is quite normal in the local condition, but the postcomensural part of the fornix is missing. So what is that? The fornix is one um, uh, axonal tract. So the cell body of um, the neuron are located in the anterior part of the hippocampus in the subiculum. And the neuron from here extend long axon towards the septum and the mammillary body at the end. So uh, this fornix belongs to a circuit named Papel circuit, which is known to regulate emotional states and uh, long-term memory, for example. So in our case, most of the tracts were quite normal, but um, this uh, seems to be very uh, strongly affected. So we check, and for that, Jean Christophe used a um, newly developed um, clearing method. So here we have a brain, so we uh, breed the mice with reporting mice at, um, uh, exhibiting um, fluorescent neurons in the subiculum. And when you do, you go through the clearing method, at the end you can image the full brain. And thanks to the fluorescence uh, carried by uh, the YHP Thai mice, uh, we were able to see the full fornix. So here, from the subiculum, you have the extension going to the septum and reaching the mammary body. So we did this in wild type and knockout condition. And as you can see, here in well type condition, you can see the full fornix with the septum and reaching to the mammillary body. It's very, very uh, well resolved. And in knockout condition, you have full disruption of uh, the post-commissural of, uh, of uh, the mammillary mammilla body. So it's again shown here in 3D. So here in normal condition, here in uh, the wild type condition. So it means that in knockout condition, you have no connection between the hippocampus and the mammillary body in the hippocampus. So there's a real, a real um, misconnectivity in MAP6 knockout code. So using this uh, DTI um, uh, sweet D technique, Jean Christophe uh, was able to investigate other um, axonal tracts. And he actually found that another um, tract, the corticospinal tract, is also highly abnormal. Uh, so you can see here that in this case, the, cell, the, the neurons are located in the layer 5 of the cortex and go through the internal capsule to the pyramidal uh, tract to reach um, um, the medulla. So here, the uh, wild type condition, you can now see, see the trap. And again, um, in uh, the knockout condition, you have a disruption of the trap. So um, again, you have a misconnectivity in the MAP6 knockout uh, brain uh, from the, the cortex and uh, the entire part of the brain. I have to say that this brain defect, uh, both the fornix and the corticospinal tract have been uh, reported to be abnormal in the various uh, studies related to schizophrenic patients. So again, it's most probable that this disconnectivity contributes to the brain, to the um, severe behavioral disorder exhibited by the mice. So uh, we uh, tried to understand why this fornix is not formed. So for that, uh, it was known uh, that the fornix formation was dependent on semaphorin 3D. So we start to work on that. So here you have a subiculum explant. So when you expose this subiculum explant to semaphorin 3D here, you have a preferential um, course about the, the semaphorin 3D. This is not working in knockout condition. 
So you can also work in vitro. So you take um, subiculum, you dissect neuron, put them in culture, expose them to semaphore and through E, and as you can see, you have a potential axonal growth through the uh, application of semaphore E. It's not working in MEP6 mutant condition. You can add semaphorin through it. You have no potentiation of axonal growth. So MEP6 is required for semaphorin growth, promoting activity and for guidance. So we try to understand why and why MEP6 is important. So first thing we, do it, we did, we did rescue again, always the same strategy. So you have knockout, well-type neuron, knockout neuron. So we translate back the full length, MAP6E, and we, we got a nice recovery. Then we delete MAP6 from MC and MN module, showing this protein is not able to bind microtubule or tin anymore. And what we found is still a nice recovery. So it means that MAP6 is important for semaphore insulin signaling but it's not carried by microtubule or actin mining domain. So we are like first, so we went back to um, semaphore insulin E, and actually semaphore insulin E bind in neurons from the subiculum to three receptors, a tripartite receptor, plexin D1, neuropilin 1, and DGFR2. And once semaphore insulin E is bound to this tripartite receptor, we have a signal transduction pathway going to several proteins like PI3 kinase, intersectin, SARC, and through activation of this SH3 containing protein, you have transduction of the signal and it ends up with the phosphorylation of AKT and GS3 kinase. So we start to check in MAP6 knockout neuron the presence of the SWA receptor and we found no difference. And we also found that um, the signaling, um, com in the complex the signaling partner is VGFR2 uh, and it's phosphorylated. And we found that, yes, indeed, in MAP6 condition, uh, the phosphorylation of MAP6 um, of uh, VGFR2 is normal. So it seems that SEMA3 bind to the receptor, that the receptor is activated. So we went back and start to get uh, interested in this. So here you have several uh, SH3 containing protein. So um, we went back to uh, MAP6 sequence and found that uh, MAP6 contain several proline rich domain which are known to bind to SH3 containing protein. So we did the bet and we delete this proline rich domain, a short sequence in MAP6, and we did the rescue. So the wild type is working very well. And when we did the rescue with this deleted the PRD domain, we have no rescue. So it means that the proline rich domain of MAP6 are required for semaphore in screen signaling. So we um, investigate the possibilities that the MAP6 through clear the domain interact with SH3 containing protein. And yes, indeed, what we found is that uh, MAP6 in this pellet essay here was able to interact with both P85 um, to various kinds of uh, intersecting and to SARC. Also, we did it in the pull down. So here you have um, interaction between uh, MAP6 and uh, intersecting and P85. And also, by other uh, experiments, we were able to show that MAP6 actually bind to all these intersecting PI3 kinase, SAR, but also to the three receptor, he binds, um, is able to interact directly with all of them. And uh, what uh, we check is the final transduction pathway is the activation of AKT and GS3 kinase. And in MAP6 uh, knockout condition, we don't have this activation. So we believe that MAP6 is key to integrate the sig signal of uh, semaphorin here and to make the link, the interface between uh, SH3 um, containing protein and uh, the neuro uh, receptor. So um, 
we know that ITC um, is phosphorylated when uh, semaphorin binds to microtubules, so we can imagine a positive loop with AKT phosphorylating MAP6, which is bound to microtubule, and releasing MAP6 from microtubule to go uh, to the semaphorin through the receptor. So what we don't know yet is uh, if semaphorin 3 is also important for the corticospinal tract formation and still under investigation. By doing this, I hope I convince you that the MAP6 is very important for uh, the formation of fornix for axonal tract formation and so and thus for neuronal connectivity. And this is carried by pair PRD domain, not through microtubule stabilization, and the MAPC is able to interact with cream, the serum P protein by SH3 containing protein and with the receptor of guidance uh, in our case of semaphorin therapy. So uh, MAPS and MAP6 especially are really more uh, than microtubule mining proteins. So um, we um, if MAP6 knockout mice exhibit so severe behavioral disorder is perhaps due to this multiple um, function of MAP6, including the signaling ones. Uh, also to say that um, um, we got um, rescue with uh, MAP6 deleted from uh, microtubule binding domain, but uh, as I said, it was uh, overexpression study and rescue experiment. So what we start to think is perhaps MAP6 is on microtubules most of the time to be ready to do other job and available to for their functions, so to enter the spine, for example, to stabilize it in or to um, reach um, signaling uh, pathway and uh, neuroreceptor or guidance to receptors to signal. So I would like now to shift to more um, uh, in vivo studies, so as I said, uh, I'm convinced that um, cytoskeleton are key uh, components for plasticity and for cognition, and I was not alone. <laughs> Gloria Benitez King was in uh, 2004, was um, already uh, stating that the normal cytoskeleton was a good target for schizophrenia, and more recently other uh, review highlight the role of microtubule and microtubule associated protein in psychiatric disease uh, with um, Eleanor Coffey I'm collaborating with. So, uh, as I said, uh, MAP6 knockout mice has very severe behavioral and logical deficit, which were reminiscent of schizophrenia-like uh, symptoms. And accordingly, um, we uh, um, performed some uh, pharmacological study related to schizophrenia. So here is a summary of the behavioral disorder exhibited by the mice. So the mice are doing things more than wild type. For example, they are um, doing hyper locomotion. They have also a fragmentation of their activity in the cage. They are things they are doing less than wild type. So for example, we have a complete maternal defect. It's versus knockout mice, uh, unable to take care of the pups, and all the, the pups will always die if the mother is MAP6 knockout. We have also a very severe social withdrawal. So in this case, in this case we are using the resident intruder uh, paradigm, and we investigate the, the time span to investigate the um, uh, intruder, and the MAP6 knockout mice have a severe defect, no interest for the congenier. Also, we have uh, the mice have very uh, severe cognitive defect, and for example, um, in the object recognition test, where the mice is supposed to remember um, a known object and to be uh, interested by uh, the new object, uh, mice is not that mice have no um, uh, are not able to discriminate the known and the unfamiliar object and so on. So as I said, we believe our model is a good model for schizophrenia and accordingly we uh, investigate the um, ability of um, uh, antipsychotic, neuroleptic to alleviate uh, the defect. 
So we use as a atypical or typical neuroleptic with aldol, fluorpromazine, or risperdal, the three main uh, antipsychotic. And we are able to show, for example, that aldol treatment induces a nice recovery of the impaired synaptic vesicular pool in the knockout. Uh, also, clozapine was able to restore a normal LTP in the knockout animal, as shown here. Uh, and of course, this uh, long-term treatment was also able to normalize behavioral defect. So here you have um, knockout mice, and when you give them aldol and propromazine, you have a better behavior. And um, with long-term treatment with uh, aldol, we were able to have some surviving pups, uh, and not in, uh, so as I said, we need to long-term treat the mice for at least one month to get time to uh, recover a quite normal pain. Also, we showed that risperdone or clozapine were able to um, alleviate the social withdrawal with a better uh, interest for the congenial after treatment. Um, this finding uh, that neuroleptic were able to induce um, uh, alleviation of the defect, behavioral and biological defect in the mice, um, allow us to propose that perhaps cytoskeleton related drugs may, may act as propagative drugs. So we test that. So the first thing we did, so most probably you know, Taxol, which is a microtubule stabilizer, is not able to enter the brain. So we used uh, some collaboration with um, Offle in Germany, Eposidon, and um, thanks to um, Jean Offle, who chose Eposidon D, which was able to enter the brain and to be uh, lipophilic, so uh, uh, supposed to accumulate in the brain. So by doing this, using a long-term treatment with a very low dose of EpoD, we were um, thinking that perhaps we can act on microtubule dynamics without having a side effects uh, on mitosis, for example. So we treat the mice with EPOD for long at very low concentration, and we were able to show that um, EPOD treatment again normalize the synaptic vesicular pools, normalize LTP as compared to um, knockout when the threads are like wild type and also improved behavior. So again, here we have the Mapsis knockout mice with their pups, uh, with our pups at uh, day five, so the pups survive, you know, thanks to the treatment by EPOD, and also uh, the working memory was um, improved with uh, better recognition of the novel object, you know, the novel object recognition test. So EPOD was able to restore a normal um, uh, behavior. And also what we did, again, in collaboration with the imaging team here in Grenoble, we showed that Mapsic knockout mice have abnormal neuronal transport. So we use another imaging, NMR, with the manganese. So you inject manganese here, and then you monitor the transport of manganese. So it's going through synapses. It's really neuronal transport, not axonal. So when you do that, you can image the amount of manganese in various areas. And if you compare wild-type animals with MAP6 knockout, here you have a defect on the transport with less manganese in several areas, like the internal capsule or the anterior thalamus. And now if we are taking knockout mice, we give them EPOD, and you can see that we restore the transport. So EPOD was able globally to uh, alleviate neuronal transport in uh, mice. So EPOD is actually um, um, carried by uh, bristol myers squibs and uh, in under um, clinical trials that it's very hard to know what's going on there. So we also work with another uh, microtubule related drugs which is uh, called Davunitide. So this work is has been entirely done by uh, Ilana Gozes in Israel in collaboration. So Ilana is working with Davinetide, uh, which is um, a molecule, a neuroprotective peptide coming from um, ADNP uh, proteins. And Ilana showed that uh, Davinetide improves um, the working memory uh, again in the object recognition test. 
And uh, more recently in Grenoble, we uh, collaborate with Laurent Sapenscher, who is working with the Lyme kinase. So she developed some inhibitors of this kinase. So this kinase is very interesting because um, uh, Lyme kinase is located in the, in the, um, in the spine. And uh, it's, uh, Laurent showed that uh, Lyme kinase regulates both actin and microtubule dynamic. Uh, and uh, we obtain some inhibitors. So the name is Spear One. So again, we um, treat our mice with Spear One for quite long, and uh, a long-term treatment with Spear One uh, was able to restore normal uh, density of dermatic spines in knockout condition, as you can see either in vitro, in culture, or in vivo. And uh, again. Um, long-term treatment restore normal plasticity with LP. So here, untreat, untreat, untreated animals, and we have a restoration of um, uh, synaptic plasticity in the brain of Mapsix knockout mice, and it's associated with a uh, better behavior. So uh, in this case, we use a social interaction test, and again, you can see that in peer uh, one treatment. Uh, increase the time span to investigate. And we use another test, which is the um, NSF test, which um, um, is um, related to memory, and um, we can see that we have an improvement of the, of, um, the mice in this test. So all together, it showed that, again, uh, another um, uh, way to um, modulate uh, actin and microtubule dynamic in spines so, uh, thanks to the use of peer one an inhibitor of uh, lime kinase is good for the for the mice so uh, in summary uh, eposidon d lime kinase inhibitor daponetide all of them all these cytoskeleton related drugs can work in cognitive defect I believe are pro-cognitive uh, uh, molecules. So to summarize, uh, what I have uh, said to you with MAP6 is that uh, uh, it's really linked to cognitive ability, but we are working with other um, proteins in the team and more especially with uh, uh, tubulin post-functional modification. And as I said, we are working on tyrosine um, tyrosination cycle and two enzymes, the tubulin tyrosine ligase or the tubulin carboxypeptidase and regulators, as we have shown that they are very key also for cognition. And for example, human deficient for the TCP, a very severe um, cognitive um, disorder, uh, they are intellectually disabled. Also, uh, MAP1B has been um, knockout. Um, uh, mutant humans uh, have been shown to have a severe um, intellectual disability and white matter deficit. So what we believe is whatever the gene, um, they have all, all the convergent points, which is the modulation of microtubule dynamic and stability, which is very, this balance between the two, is very important for synaptic development and uh, to brain development, but also to synaptic Plasticity and as soon as one of these proteins is impaired, it can lead, it can lead to what is called psychiatric disorder, um, what, whatever you are schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or autism or um, um, intellectual disability. And the convergent point, at least for all maps, is white matter def defect which can, uh, at the end, induce cognitive defect uh, found in this disease. So I hope I convince you that microtubules, actin, and their effector are key targets to develop a cognitive drug, and uh, we are working very actively in this field with private company to uh, try to develop inhibitors or activators of this uh, enzyme, which are easily uh, worked um, because they are enzyme as compared to MAP6, for example. So to finish, I would like to thank all people in my team. We collaborated with, um, we did all this work over years. So my team, but also all collaborating imaging uh, teams and also
So again, I want to thank you again for your attention. I'm so sad to not be with you, and hopefully uh, we'll meet at one point. Thank you very much again for your attention. Thank you.